functions and function notations. Part A, functions. Well, what is a function? Well, a function is a special kind of relation in which there is only one output value or range value for every valid input value or domain value. So how do we know if something's a function or not? Well, for graphs, it's somewhat simple. We use something called the vertical line test. To use the vertical line test, we take a straight edge, place it vertically on one side of our graph, and drag the straight edge across, noting whether it crosses our relation at more than one point. If it does not cross at more than one point, it means it is a function. So let's take a look at our first example. This is a parabola. Notice what happens when I drag my vertical line across my function, my relation. Did you notice that? It never crossed more than once. Therefore, this is a function. Look at my second example. Watch what happens when I drag my vertical line across it. Did you notice that? When I dragged it across, at almost all points, there were two areas or points where it crossed my relation. Therefore, there is more than one output for every input. That means that this is not a function. How about for table of values? How do we know if it's a function then? Well, for it to be a function, the domain values do not repeat. So let's look at my first example. My domain values are one, two, three, four. Notice none of them repeat. So what does that mean? For every input, there is only one output. That means that this is a function. Look at my second example. My domain values are one, two, two, four. So what do I have? I have two twos or one of my domain values repeats. Therefore, the value two has two different possible answers of six and seven. Therefore, this isn't a function. All right, what happens if we're talking about ordered pairs? Well, it's the same thing as table of values. We look for the fact that domain values don't repeat. So let's look at my first example. Notice I've got two ones. Two ones means that the same input or domain value has two range values. So the answer for one can be nine or 17. Since the domain value occurs more than once, this relation isn't a function. Now look at my second example. My domain values are one, two, three, four, five. Notice, no domain value occurs more than once. Therefore, this is a function. Function notation. Function notation is a special kind of way to write an equation. So, notice my first equation, f is equal to three x minus four. How would I write this in function notation? I would take my independent variable of x and I would put it in brackets in front of my dependent variable. This is not f times x. This is stated as f of x. So if we were to take that equation above and we were to put three in for x, we would get an answer or output of five. So let's start by converting to function notation. Example number one, f is equal to four x minus one. How do I convert this to function notation? I take an x and I put it in brackets in front of the f. Now remember, this is not f times x, it's f of x. Stop this recording now and try two and three. All right, hopefully you wound up getting V of T is equal to 9.8 T squared. You should have taken the T and put it in front of the V in brackets. For number three, you should have taken R and put it in brackets in front of C. 
how do we use function notation with numbers? Well, here is an example on how to convert temperature from degrees Celsius to degrees Fahrenheit. The equation is F of C is equal to 1.8 C plus 32. Our first example says determine the value of F of 20. So what does that mean? Well, if we look at our equation, F of C replaces C with 20. So that means that anywhere in my equation, I'm going to replace C with 20. Now, on the left hand side is F of 20. So we're just going to leave that as it is. On the right hand side, I'm now going to have to perform my operations. Bedmass says I do multiplying before I do adding. Therefore, I'm going to multiply 1.8 times 20 first, giving me 36. Now, I'm going to add those two together, 36 and 32, giving me F of 20 is equal to 68. Or, 20 degrees Celsius is equal to 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Try number two on your own, and I'll do it in a second. Okay, hopefully you should have gotten this. All right, let's go down and work backwards. What happens if we're given the temperature in Fahrenheit and we wanna know what it is in Celsius? Well, again, let's start out by writing out our equation. Notice, F of C is equal to 86. So what does that mean? I'm gonna replace F of C with 86. Now I need to work backwards to find out what C is. So what's my first step? Well, I need to get rid of 32. It is being added, so I'm going to do the opposite and subtract 32 from both sides, leaving me with 54 is equal to 1.8 C. I now need to get rid of 1.8, which is multiplying by C. The opposite of multiplying is to divide both sides by 1.8. Finally, this gives me an answer of C is equal to 30, or 30 degrees Celsius is equal to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Stop the tape and try number two. Okay, hopefully you wound up with an answer of 11.1. Part C, using linear functions. Johnny's cell phone plan has a flat fee of $25 plus $8 for every 100 megabytes of data used. A. Write the function total cost as a function of data used. Well, first of all, my dependent variable is going to be cost, or C. My independent variable is going to be data used. Why? Because the cost depends on how much data is used. So, first thing, I'm going to write C of D is equal to 25. Why? Because he pays $25 no matter what. Now, how much does he pay on top of this? Well, for every 100 megabytes of data used, he is going to use $8 or be charged $8. So if he uses 100 megabytes, he's charged $8, 8 times 1. 200 megabytes, 8 times 2. 300 megabytes, 8 times 3. D megabytes, 8 times D. So that would be my formula, my function. B, make a table of values for the function from 0 to 400 megabytes. First, my independent variable is the amount of data. Now, I'm going to measure this in numbers of hundreds of megabytes. Why? Because it's easier to keep track of. Because he pays my, his $8 per 100 megabytes. My independent, my dependent variable is going to be cost. Now, how do I set up my independent values? Well, I've got to go from 0 to 400. So I've decided I'm going to go up by one hundreds. So I'm starting with zero, then 100, 200, 300, 400. Notice that I've only listed one, two, three, four, because 
At the top, I've said I'm measuring this in hundreds of megabytes. So what is my cost? Well, at zero megabytes used, he pays a flat fee of $25. If he uses 100 megabytes, that's going to be one times $8, and I'm going to have to pay an additional $8. 200 megabytes means I'm going to have to pay an additional $8 again. 300 megabytes, add another $8. 400 megabytes, add another $8. C, graph this function. Well, first thing, my dependent variable is like y, which is cost. Now, I've got to go up to 57. 57 is close to 60. And based on the fact that I've got eight spaces, I've decided I'm going to go up, make each space worth 10. My independent variable is the amount of data. I'm measuring this in 100 megabytes. I've got eight spaces. I've got four numbers that I've got to put. I've got to go up to four. So I've decided I'm going to make each two spaces worth 100 megabytes. Now I'm ready to graph my points. At zero, my cost is 25. At one, so go over one, I go up 33. Over two, up 41, over 3, up 49, over 4, up 57. Notice this is a linear relationship because we are adding a constant amount each time. Now, before I go on, I can't forget all graphs require a title. Part D. Use the graph to find C of 350. So, basically, Instead of using the equation, what I need to do is find an input value of 350 or 350 megabytes. I go to 350 and I draw a vertical line up to, if we had drawn a line in between these points, where it would have crossed. I now draw a horizontal line across and find the matching Y value. So what matching Y value do I have for um, an input of 350, that means this C of 350 is equal to 53.